Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Daniel Canstrom, and uh, I serve as the faculty director of the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy at Boston College Law School. And together with our executive director, Elizabeth Medvedow, and our assistant director, Cindy Wynn, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here to this uh, event, co-sponsored by the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies and the Boston College Black Law Students Association. The Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy at BC Law School brings together the region's top policymakers and thought leaders to engage in dynamic discussions on critical public policy issues. Today's program, which will address an array of extremely important and complex issues under the general title of zoning and equity, is one of many we have organized already this year, and we will organize more as part of our inquiries into challenging contemporary matters of law and public policy. It dovetails with many other aspects of our programming, all of which aims to foster vigorous, open discussion of ideas among government, business, nonprofit, and academic thought leaders, such as our senior fellows program. This year's senior fellow was Ivan Espinoza Madrigal from Lawyers for Civil Rights and the Jerome Lyle Rappaport Distinguished Visiting Professor in Law and Public Policy, which has recently been held by Richard Cordray, former Governor James Swift, former Connecticut Governor Daniel Malloy, former Massachusetts Supreme Court Justices Robert Cordray and Geraldine Hines, former U.S. Attorney Carmen Ortiz, and former Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley. Please do visit our website for more information about upcoming programs and our wonderful summer fellowship program for students and much more. Please do note as you're coming on to this program that it is being recorded. Um, also, we plan to reserve about 20 minutes at the end for a Q&A session, and please use the Q&A function for that. We're very appreciative that David Luberoff, the Deputy Director of the Joint Center for Housing Studies, has agreed to curate and handle that Q&A. Uh, David is the author of many articles and case studies on the politics of infrastructure and land use policies, as well as co-author of the book, Mega Projects, The Changing Politics of Urban Public Investment. David was also a former executive director of our sister Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston at Harvard's Kennedy School. And also we have a student who has generously stepped up to help us close out the program. This is very important as we work really hard to engage students in our work. And it's always a true pleasure to see a new generation join us. So let me introduce her now and you'll, you'll hear from her at the very end. Grace Tillman is a first year, that is to say a 1L Boston College law student from Birmingham, Alabama, who graduated magna cum laude from Loyola University in New Orleans with a bachelor of science in music industry studies and a minor in mass communications. She held leadership positions in various organizations, including the Black Student Union, She's not an active member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority and a section representative of the Black Law Students Association of Boston College, which, as I said, is one of our co-sponsors for today's program. So now let's get to zoning and equity, two intertwined topics that are as compelling and essential as any that one can imagine. I'm going to turn things over to Amy Dane. Let me just briefly introduce Amy. Uh, Amy is an independent consultant in public policy research and writing with a focus on urban planning and housing policy. She is the author of The State of Zoning for Multifamily Housing in Greater Boston, a survey of zoning and plans in 100 cities and towns. Amy's career has included important work with many Massachusetts-based think tanks. She has worked in-house and as a consultant on projects for the Collins Center for Public Management, the Pioneer Institute for Public Policy Research, the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston, Mass Inc., the Massachusetts Smart Growth Alliance, the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Boston, and other organizations. In 2008, she launched the StatNet Initiative, which is a community of practice for municipal managers interested in data-driven decision-making. Amy received a master in public policy degree from Harvard's Kennedy School, and um, she will introduce an absolutely stellar panel of speakers to you. So with gratitude and now with silence, I turn it over to Amy Dane. Thank you very much, Amy. Thank you so much. I'm going to start out with a presentation, my opening presentation, then I will introduce the speakers and they will give opening presentations. 
And um, thank you again to the organizations um, hosting this and making this possible. From the beginning, let's see. There we are. Oh, and it's not a draft. Um, okay. So I am presenting a case study on zoning and equity in cities and towns north of Boston. Zoning is a tool um, to manage growth, but it's more often used to just to suppress growth. When we fail to build enough housing, prices escalate, and it's estimated that we're short hundreds of thousands of homes in Massachusetts. To be clear, all cities and towns of the region highly restrict housing development. But I have noticed that on average, towns restrict housing much more than cities do. I was once asked, why do cities allow more housing than towns? And so I'm going to use this presentation to review six hypotheses or factors. My case study covers 25 cities and towns. Before I get into the hypotheses, let's review how many homes have been built in each city and town north of Boston in the last decade. The only centralized place to find this data is the US Census. The numbers are self-reported by municipalities. The problem is that some of the numbers are wrong. It's hard to know which to trust. Malden is listed as permitting 82 dwelling units in the last decade. That's missing thousands of units. I did a little investigation reviewing major projects, not enough for precise numbers. I grouped municipalities into categories, a thousand or more units, hundreds of units, low hundreds, tens of units. The most urban cities north of Boston are permitting much more housing than the leafy towns. Cities may not be allowing enough housing to meet demand overall, but the towns in the right hand column in particular have extremely restrictive zoning. Now there are variations in home building across municipalities. There are also variations in home values. 2019 median sales price of a single family home varies from $375,000 um, $375, in the city of Lynn to more than a million dollars in the town of Winchester. In a well-functioning market, we would expect to see more building where the housing is the most expensive. Construction costs are similar across communities. Landowners make more money building on properties where sales prices are higher. But this dynamic is not what we see here. There's more building where the prices are lower. Lynn, Chelsea, Revere, Everett, Malden, Woburn. There's almost no building in the most expensive places. Manchester by the Sea, Marblehead, Wenham, Hamilton. So what accounts for the stark difference between cities and towns? I'm gonna to walk through the six hypotheses that I came up with. Uh, first, cities have city councils, towns have town meetings. It's representative democracy versus direct democracy. With direct democracy, neighbors of a project or a district to be rezoned are motivated to show up to town meeting where they might be overrepresented. Number two, second, where is most housing going all across greater Boston? former industrial properties. Municipal decision makers are typically motivated to see brownfields redeveloped. The cities have more brownfields than the towns do. Third, the issue of character. At local hearings, many people express concerns that new housing will not match the character of a community. This can be an architectural concern or an expression of chauvinism, a desire to keep out lower income people and keep out renters. Some communities are mostly single family homes. See the yellow at the top of the chart. Hamilton, Wenham, Essex, Winchester, Manchester, Marblehead. These places have hardly any zoning for multifamily housing. Communities that have more multifamily housing are allowing more multifamily housing. See the blue on the chart for apartments in cities like Chelsea, Lynn, Malden, Revere, Everett. Uh, fourth, it's state policy to promote housing development in areas that are walkable, close to transit, and have good infrastructure. Our cities are highly walkable and amenity rich. They have the best transit options, orange line, blue line, commuter rail, rail trails, bus networks. Most of the towns have walkable centers, but they're not nearly as transit rich, and some towns lack sewer systems. Five. Research from Boston University shows that homeowners are overrepresented in local politics relative to renters. And I was just wondering if the city homeowner voter and town homeowner voter may perceive different value propositions 
uh, from growth. Six, power inequities. Wealth and power have concentrated in some places and not others. In affluent communities, people have more time, connections, money, and English language skills to influence the system than in other communities. Homeowners desiring to keep renters out of town can keep renters out. Most residents of towns own their own homes. That's a lot of wealth in and of itself. As the chart shows at the top um, in gray, uh, most residents in the cities of Chelsea and Everett do not own their own homes. In less affluent communities, neighbors who might oppose construction have fewer resources to take a project to court or organize a campaign. These are charts of segregation. We have towns that are almost entirely white. We have towns that are 99% white. Several of the cities are minority majority. Chelsea is 20% white. 9% of Massachusetts residents statewide are black. The towns with the fewest black residents are permitting the least housing. So these are some possible reasons for differences in housing policies across municipalities. Other questions remain, of course, how do we address the inequities going forward and where should our housing policies favor building, among other questions. And I'm going to close with this. Ipswich Town Meeting just voted to reduce the allowed density um, in its walkable downtown. And a speaker at its town meeting um, stood up and said, if you don't want to drive somewhere to buy a quart of milk, move to a city. And that is my presentation. I'm gonna stop the sharing. And uh, introduce our next speakers who will have their opening comments and then we'll have a discussion. Uh, so first up will be Sarah Bronin, who is an architect, an attorney, a professor, prolific writer, um, and the founder of Desegregate Connecticut, which is a coalition of more than 75 organizations. She was recently nominated by the Biden administration to chair the U.S. Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. She's a national leader on zoning policy. She led the overhaul of the zoning code in Hartford, Connecticut. She has a book coming out on zoning policy, and she's also written on climate change, housing, urban planning, transportation, real estate development. Next up, we'll have Lydia Edwards, is a Boston City Councilor representing East Boston, Charlestown, and the North End. She's a career advocate and activist on behalf of society's most vulnerable. She's chairing Boston City Council's Committee on Housing and Community Development and the Committee on Government Operations. She's worked extensively on issues of affordable housing, traffic, pollution, among other things. Um, she has also worked as a law clerk and a public interest attorney, and she's running for state senate. And Harley Etienne is an associate professor of urban and regional planning at the University of Michigan's Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, and he's soon starting a new position as associate professor at the Knowlton School of Architecture at Ohio State University. His teaching and research is at the intersection of community development, neighborhood planning, social justice, and law. His research focuses on social institutions and urban neighborhood change. Uh, so with all of that lead up, we will turn this over to Sarah uh, to make her first presentation. Well, Amy, thank you so much for that um, introduction. And thank you to all of the hosts, Boston College, Harvard, um, for this great event. I'm going to share my screen. I know I have five minutes. Um, and they've asked me to present uh, everything that, that uh, happened uh, at Desegregate Connecticut in a nutshell. Um, so with that, I'm going to, um, do you see all of my slides here? Or do you see just the main slide? Somehow I went into presentation mode. One second. Let me try that again. Um, so in, in any case, as Amy said, I have helped to lead this effort in Connecticut on um, uh, to really help to try to start uh, the process of uh, changing our land use regulations uh, from what they have been to uh, something hopefully better. 
Um, I am going to, maybe you can see all of my slides, but it looks like we're stuck with that. Um, okay, so what have we done and how? Um, we have, uh, through our organization, assembled a really broad team of uh, individuals. Um, we have, uh, from all across the state, primarily young people, including uh, a, a first year student, Eleni Nyland at the Kennedy School. Um, we have, as Amy mentioned, a large coalition of nonprofits. Uh, to help gain support and education for zoning uh, reform, we had a number of events with about 2,000, uh, over 2,000 people, briefings for planning and zoning commissioners, uh, census deep dives, uh, membership happy hours, video launch party, and even academic events. Uh, we did a series of videos about uh, people's experience in zoning and how zoning uh, affects them. We helped to ensure that over 70 op-eds were placed in Connecticut papers all around the state in support of zoning reform that favors equity. We've done press conferences. We did a, a rally, an in-person rally. We started, I should have said, last year in June 2020 um, in response to George Floyd's murder uh, because really, um, again, highlighted uh, the need for reform on a number of fronts, including zoning. So this was during COVID. We had, you can see all the masks. Um, we had a virtual public hearing on a bill that we helped to draft. It was 24 hours. Um, there's a ton of testimony that you can read on our website. We'd love to have you crib uh, that testimony for your own purposes and your own jurisdiction. Um, so we had over 300 people submit testimony in favor of this bill and the hearing lasted 24 straight hours. Um, so just a first lesson in that, uh, there's a lot of power in partnerships and building coalitions uh, across outside of the housing community to pass zoning reform. In addition to all of those advocacy pieces, we also uh, really built an irrefutable case that Connecticut has one size fits all zoning, single family zoning on large lots. And how we did that was through something called the Zoning Atlas. There are 169 towns in Connecticut, 180 zoning jurisdictions. We looked at 32,000 pages of zoning data and uh, looked at all of the housing characteristics for 2,600 zoning districts in all of those areas uh, and put together 80 data points on the number of units that are allowed in certain zoning districts, the minimum lot sizes, whether accessory dwellings are allowed, lot coverage, FAR, height, uh, all kinds of requirements and compiled some of that in the public facing zoning atlas. The rest is, uh, is really in our, in our files at this point. Um, and you can see uh, this image, and I'm not sure if it'll work in this view, but um, this shows where single family housing is allowed in purple in the Hartford region. This shows where two family housing is allowed where three family housing is allowed and where four family housing is allowed, uh, even with public hearings. So yeah, this is, uh, um, this is uh, it, the, the numbers are even starker if you uh, put in the zoning atlas uh, as of right for family housing. Um, this kind of reinforces what Amy was just saying about housing being concentrated in certain places and it's uh, a way to see it visually. Statewide, here you see our map of 91% of single family housing in Connecticut for as of right housing, and just 2.3% of Connecticut uh, with four family housing as of right. I mean, it couldn't be starker. So again, we really built this case. And I would say that uh, one of the things that we also uh, wanna mention is the power of research. And then finally, um, they asked me to say what actually happened. Um, so I'll just say briefly, a year and a day after we first started meeting in June of 2020, uh, the legislature passed the first zoning reforms in Connecticut in over 30 years. We were very excited about that, to say the least. But part of it was by thinking about this zoning reform uh, effort uh, as a campaign and also as something that needed to be supported by data. Um, that legislation didn't tackle everything we wanted, but uh, we did get uh, a few good things done. They're summarized at the website at the top. I don't have time to talk about all of them today, uh, but among other things, it legalized accessory apartments, uh, capped parking mandates uh, for the first time, I think, in any state. Um, the way that we did it, there are opt-outs for both of those first two provisions we can talk about in the Q&A. Uh, required training for commissioners, eliminated the term character from zoning decisions, something Amy also mentioned, and creates a statewide form-based code. 
uh, which we hope will uh, lead to uh, better decision making. So uh, another lesson from our movement is go ahead and try for a lot. And then you, maybe you might get something pretty, uh, pretty robust as a starting point. So we know that that's not the end. So what's next? We are um, really trying to educate people about the need for accessory apartments, a very uh, easy kind of housing to create uh, in uh, high income, at low income, middle income neighborhoods. It works everywhere. Uh, we also have a three part policy agenda for 2022. Uh, minimum lot size reform, transit-oriented communities, as well as some streamlining on the municipal uh, rulemaking front. We have an, an event series. Uh, we're really looking forward to it. Uh, again, focused on our advocacy, transit, minimum lot size. Uh, we have a new set of videos coming out on Wednesday, and I would love for you to attend that. That's going to be awesome. Uh, we have new 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 crop of people speaking about zoning. Uh, we do have membership levels, so we're trying to get to the point of California YIMBY, which has 80,000 members, um, and you can learn more about uh, us on the website. But hopefully that's, at, and follow us on Twitter uh, as well, and uh, keep up with the latest. But hopefully that's a good enough overview uh, to set the stage of what's been happening in Connecticut. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Amy. Uh, so next up, we've got um, Lydia Edwards, Councillor Lydia Edwards is speaking. Thank you very much. Um, I, again, just want to thank uh, this opportunity to really talk about uh, what we're doing over in Boston and dealing with, I think, uh, the crux of the housing crisis. Your presentation, by the way, was a perfect example of what we're dealing regionally, but honestly, just within my district, depending on where you live in Boston, you have the same single family home area in some parts, and then you have multifamily literally in the same neighborhood. And there is a debate about uh, how people want to build, what they envision their neighborhoods as, and who they feel belongs or doesn't belong in those neighborhoods. And that has everything to do with zoning. So just to give some background, I'm, I'm not gonna do a PowerPoint because I feel like I would go through the slides too, too fast, but I, um, I wanted to give some quick uh, understanding for working uh, vocabulary on AFFH, which is Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing. Under the Obama administration, um, the final rule regulating housing, right, regulating this rule, which has been in, in, in the law since the 60s, um, really came about in his administration push to make sure that we didn't just have housing policy or fair housing policy that was about not discriminating, that that wasn't good enough. Essentially, that's the baseline. Instead, we need to be actually moving towards integrated communities and need to be taking meaningful actions to remove obstacles to opportunities. Uh, that is truly affirmatively furthering for housing and making sure that we're building neighborhoods that are integrated. So that was in 2015, the Trump administration and, and did all they could to basically take that uh, regulation away. And uh, in Boston, we decided that we would actually create our own version of it. And two agencies immediately adopted it, but that was our public housing and our Department of Neighborhood Development. Our zoning was relatively left um, alone to deal with zoning or, or to deal with a, a racial integration or racial um, justice in, in zoning is predominantly left in the area of affirmative marketing. As in, after they built it, um, we will affirmatively market to all diverse communities and explain to them that they can't afford to live there. Sorry to be so snarky, but that's really what was happening. Um, and a perfect example of that was the seaport. The seaport is the newest neighborhood in Boston, which was built on vacant uh, land. And uh, it was a wonderful opportunity to take so many of the lessons learned about uh, redlining, about zoning, about exclusive communities, about environmental justice, about all of these things. And, and if you look at the end result, you don't see any of those lessons. What you see is one of the richest and whitest neighborhoods ever built. And that was just done. And what that means to a lot of people who are pro density, I hope they learned that lesson, just density and just building isn't enough. You, if you want to, to be and have an integrated neighborhood, if you want to obliterate concentrations of poverty and wealth, and if you want families, which is the largest group uh, being discriminated against in the housing market to be welcome, you must be intentional in your zoning 
in order to do that. And that's what we created the affirmatively furthering for housing zoning amendment. And so now when uh, developers come to the city of Boston, uh, you must actually go through an entire uh, analysis as to whether your uh, the area you're purchasing in will first let you know if you are in a highly, um, if you're in a displacement zone or if you're in a historically exclusive zone, we will let you know about the history that you're purchasing. And I think that's really important for developers and for those who choose to come to make money in the city of Boston or any neighborhood. They need to understand they're not purchasing it in today with today's dollar. You're purchasing all the injury, the harm, the exclusivity, the discrimination, and the good things as well that happened that led up to the way the neighborhood looks. You are also purchasing the future. You're responsible for how your building impacts. And I think the greatest example of that is our environmental policy. We have no problem adjusting, moving, and demanding more developers and builders uh, by saying, you bought it as a brownfield. I think that came up recently. You need to make sure it's not staying as a brownfield, and we're going to give you standards to make sure you don't. This is no greater or no less than what we would do in demand of developers when it comes to traffic, when it comes to the environment, when it comes to uh, building design and height. You cannot cause further injury with how you build, where you place, and how you price your building. So along with getting those reports, they also have to go through a self-assessed assessment report, which tool, toolkit, which was designed by community activists. And we ask all questions. Who'd you buy it from? Did you demand that the building be empty? What are the average rents? Who was there before? Are you getting rid of the only bodega, the only store that we have? What are you replacing it with? Are you going to have high commercial rents? Because commercial displacement also is a big deal. And creating a food desert where there wasn't one before. We've created a place in Charlestown, for example, uh, we don't have laundromats, but we also have the largest housing development in New England. I'll repeat that. We have the largest housing development in New England and no laundromats, no places for them to wash their clothes. They have to get on the buses and go to different towns to wash their clothing. So what does that mean if a developer comes in and they say, I want to do commercial space? It means for me and the city of Boston, I hope you're building a laundromat. We're prioritizing that. Matter of fact, if you're not doing that or taking anything away from this community, we're not going to permit your project anymore. That's affirmatively furthering for housing. You are responsible for the healing of this neighborhood as well. And so we run through all of the, the questions, they get the reports, and then they have to come back to a newly created interdepartmental um, committee that will assess if you are affirmatively furthering for housing with your project. And they have a whole list of mitigation that is growing every single day, including right of first refusal, uh, which is a TOPA, Tenants Opportunity Purchase Act. Are you increasing the amount of affordability? How many Section 8 vouchers are you going to have in your building? Um, how are you not just affirmatively marketing? But we come up with so many different uh, ways in which they can actually mitigate and help to integrate and help to heal a community. And they got to pick them. They have to pick some. And then you take what they've picked the harms, the reports, their self-assessment, and then we decide if they can go forward and if they can build. So that's what we do in our zoning. And, and what's key about doing it in zoning, and I'm sure the other speakers know this, you know, so much of federal, so much of civil rights and protections come with state and federal money. But a lot of people are building with their own, private money and investors. Zoning is that perfect sweet spot. It gets to government actors, but it also gets to private actors as well which is what we found with Suffolk Downs, which is the single largest private development also in my district in East Boston, 161 acres of open land in Boston to be developed and it's privately owned. And so we needed to be able to control, to push and move and hold up, hold that developer to standards. And they agreed to be, a, to uphold the affirmatively furthering fair housing new zoning amendment. So I think about my five minutes, but I did want to um, just note um, this is a tool that any town and neighborhood could use, and it can build, pe bring people together. It brings activists to the table. They want to define what it, it means. They want to define the mitigation. They want to, they want to help with the questionnaire, and, and it brings developers to the table. They did not oppose this. They just wanted to make sure it was predictable. So I'm excited about it. We're moving on it, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but thank you for this opportunity. Professor Harley Atien, you're up. Thank you, Amy. And I just a moment of personal privilege. I, I just say to Councilwoman Edwards, um, as a kid from Mattapan, I am proud and happy that you are you are there. 
So, yes, yeah. thank, thank you. you. Um, so my comments are a little bit different, a little bit less technical. And so I lots of points of agreement between me and the first two speakers. Um, but a lot of this is coming out of a piece that I wrote for the Journal of the American Planning Association last year, um, a special issue on um, whether we should eliminate single family zoning. So I wanna present three things. And so the first thing is, I'm in agreement that rezoning is a wonderful thing. This is something that we should do there in terms of increasing density, affordability, um, increasing affordability, reducing homelessness, vehicle miles traveled, um, land use. There are so many reasons why we should do this. However, um, there are three considerations I want to throw on the table. Um, one political, um, economic, and then social. Um, and they dovetail nicely with what we've heard from, um, from the councilwoman and from Professor Brian. The first is the political reality. Um, that when there have been rezonings, we've had some successes and we've had some failures, um, and many of them political in terms of misdirection and misinformation in the ways that we have dog whistles that have interfered with how rezoning efforts have um, actually played out. And so Professor Bronin's comment about the campaign is, are very useful, um, but you have to actually look at the text of the anti-rezoning campaigns and what they actually are saying. So I'll just do one example, a current example from a current effort, um, Save the Acres in Plantation Acres, Florida. Um, which is trying to turn um, very large uh, 42 um, single family zone um, uh, lots into um, about a, a, a lot, much, I forgot the exact number, several hundred, and people were very upset about this. And so, but the argument is we want to preserve the rural feel of the feel of the place. That rural feel um, is completely surrounded by um, a very dense urban um, development in one of Florida's largest counties. And so the argument that you're preserving a rural feel in this particular context is a little bit hollow. Um, so, but I just, there, there are lots of ways in which data can be useful, but there is a campaign. There's a lot on the other side kind of pushing against this. Um, and so there's something about kind of what this means about how our data and our rhetoric and strategizing around this actually has to confirm front the, the political realities of the fight that we have in places where it's really tough to do. The second um, is economic. And so one of the big concerns I have about rezonings is about, about Black home ownership in particular. Let's just focus on one group. That Black home ownership has been always never been on par with white home ownership in particular. Um, and it is now at its lowest level since the 1960s. Um, there was a large kind of loss of Black home ownership after the 2008 housing crisis. And so one of the concerns, and I, I haven't seen a lot of data that actually supports this, and I'd love to see it, um, that shows that when we add accessory dwelling units and when we rezone, that those units do not become rentals and very high cost rentals, um, and that they actually don't help um, African Americans kind of become homeowners and create the kind of uh, the trajectory of intergenerational wealth that has all sorts of other benefits. And so it's not that we're reducing the number of houses um, because we're increasing them, but are they the kind of houses that will actually create intergenerational wealth? What we have, the experience that we had here in Ann Arbor is that when we had our, we expanded our accessible dwelling unit, um, um, uh, ordinance, what happened with a lot of developers came in and purchased the homes and kind of outbid with their cash, they outbid um, buyers, um, and then really turned them into two rental units, two or three rental units on a single property. Um, so those concerns were not, they weren't, they, they were real, they were legitimate. Um, that this, we can see this happening in other places too, which is, can we actually create opportunities for um, home ownership, not just rental, and particularly affordable home uh, rentals. Um, the third is a little bit more about the social, and this is it's connected to the political. Um, one of my biggest concerns and one of the largest things um, is the power of the idea of the single family home. Um, this is something that we can say that, you know, zoning is kind of the thing in the background, but we're dealing with something much larger that, um, and the way that I wrote this in this chapter piece is that if you can imagine a genie being released from the bottle and it's providing um, intergenerational wealth, it's providing stability, it's providing all these different things for the people who are able to access it, um, but it's been reified and kind of reaffirmed through our media. Um, and so this idea that we, we aspire to be in single family homes, we aspire to the white picket fence, we aspire to be George Bailey and to go to the suburbs and kind of maintain the home, we aspire to be the youngers raising in the sun and move out, we aspire to be the friends who kind of end our youth and go out to the suburbs. Um, and we've exported this idea around the globe. This is not just no longer an American phenomenon, this is a global phenomenon, um, in that 
are people actually aspiring to move into town and to use Council Emma and Edwards? Um, her example, like, do we aspire to live near a bodega? Do we aspire to be able to walk around the corner and get milk as much as we aspire to have the white picket fence? And so I think that some of this is going to be how do we do this? And so um, I like Lance Freeman's suggestion in a piece that he wrote for Brookings last year is that we think about something tantamount to an environmental impact um, statement. And this is not, um, this is on level with what we heard from Professor Braun and, and um, from Councilman Edwards, which is to think about a racial equity analysis. How we operationalize that in a very particular way, I think some of the, the, the desegregate um, Connecticut site does some of this. Um, I think we can go, maybe we can add some other things to this, but how do we think about not just um, some of the things that Professor Brown had talked about, but also about affordability um, and opportunities for home, home ownership um, and what the implications of rezonings and what they might actually look like um, and kind of actually denying um, the ability to kind of move forward unless we fully understand what the implications of that might be. So again, I, I don't wanna say that we shouldn't do it, um, but I think that there is probably a critical race theory analysis that we can apply here um, into understanding kind of the legacy of zoning, um, its links to, um, to racism, to homophobia, to xenophobia, and the ways in which um, even with rezoning that the market realities, the social realities and political realities um, can actually still, um, it can maintain and actually exacerbate some of the things that we're trying to mitigate through the rezoning efforts. So I will stop there and so we can have a discussion. Thank you, these are great presentations. I'm gonna start um, with the first question that I'm actually gonna throw out to all three um, speakers uh, about race and class. Um, so my sense is that many people see class discrimination um, and race discrimination as very different things. So um, people with means I perceive are often more comfortable with the idea of class discrimination than race discrimination. Around the suburbs here, you see a lot of lines, lawn signs for Black Lives Matter um, next to signs that oppose apartments. And at a presentation I did in Wellesley, uh, one of the people in the audience, and Wellesley is a very, one of Massachusetts' most expensive uh, elite communities, um, somebody in the audience asked me, why is it wrong for Wellesley to be exclusive? A place Place, um, people strive to live in a place that's not affordable to everybody like that is what Wellesley is and so she was like why is that wrong um, and I'm wondering what your response to her would be and do you think that exclusionary zoning is necessarily racist anybody want to jump in on that I mean, I would probably prefer, uh, to, uh, Professor Braun and probably knows way more than I'll ever, uh, she'll, she's forgotten more than I'll ever know about this, but I mean, we can go to the, the very early, the earliest ordinances, zoning ordinances in Baltimore, but they were explicitly racist. Um, that was their purpose. Um, Harlan Bartholomew, his entire career, he helped create the state enabling acts um, around the country and helped create city uh, planning commissions around the country and deliberately embedded, um, you know, racism into the ordinances that he helped create. So, you know, you know, we can make that argument, you know, kind of go back 100 years and say, you know, here's the history and it's very clear. But I think in the present moment, um, you know, we can look at the enforcement of certain policies and say, you know, the ways in which we can police um, whether unrelated individuals live together and that, you know, and that as a form of discrimination. Um, that, you know, it's not just about the density of the housing, it's also about who's living together. It's about whether they're college students and whether they're renters, whether it's multi-unit that there's a lot of things that um, maybe are, you know, maybe they're not de jure discrimination, but they're, they're certainly de facto. Um, and we, we need to unpack that. Um, and what I would say to her directly is, um, I wouldn't want Roxbury to have to shoulder the burdens um, that Wellesley doesn't want to take on. But conversely, I would want people in Boston, I was one of those kids. Um, I, I never went to Wellesley. I, I still, to be honest, I've never been to Wellesley. Um, I don't know what it looks like, except from the, what I can see from the Mass Pike. Um, there are opportunities comes from just that exposure. Um, and I think there's something you said for, um, shouldn't the kids in Boston have access to that kind of exposure as, as her children do? I'll just add to that very um, full response to say that, you know, just to reinforce that the idea that, that there was explicitly racial zoning um, that, that, that issue actually went before the Supreme Court, the zoning ordinance of the city of Louisville, 
uh, back in 1917, uh, it was the Supreme Court decided that, well, you couldn't say that there was a, I think it was a quote, colored person's zone uh, and a white zone. Um, and Louisville was not alone. There were a, a lot of cities that did that very same thing and actually uh, put people's color into the zoning ordinance. The way that it so it, the the way that things change after that 1917 decision was that instead of doing it through zoning, uh, uh, people did it through racially restrictive covenants, which were then not struck down by the Supreme Court until the mid 1940s. So this, there is a history of that. Um, as far as how we approach that history, we sort of as the the desegregate Connecticut coalition try to take people as, as good faith and, and maybe not realizing that this was the history of zoning, uh, trying to, to, to say, you know, nobody today intends this, but let's all work together to fix it. Um, that's really what we try to say. And, and to address those issues of concern, concerned homeowners. Well, I really work so hard uh, to scrape by, you know, to get all, all my pennies together to buy this multi-million dollar home on the shore. You know, why should I, um, allow anybody else to live here. Um, you know, it's really important to continue that education effort to, to help people understand, well, maybe they had privileges and advantages that other people just structurally don't have. And that's why we do so many educational events focused in specific towns across, do our, we do our statewide webinars, we go anywhere anybody asks us to go to talk about these issues to try to connect all the dots for people. Um, and that's, I think everybody uh, who's in this area's ongoing obligation. I would, I would, I, I want to do it to just just address the the why is it a problem that I want something. I think what I'm hearing from her, what I'm hearing through you is why is it a problem? I want something extra nice, and I have the money to afford it, and that other people don't. And why should why shouldn't it be something to strive for? Uh, and I think that that's because uh, Harley hit on it a little bit before we've defined in such a, a level of success what it means to make it uh, to, to really genuinely mean in order for me to make it, it means that I have to have done better than so many more other people. That's making it in the United States, <laughs> right? Uh, it is, it, it's the individualism that in our society we so deeply praise and we have people literally working to death in order to get that. That's another issue that we could talk about, you know, the, the, the overworked uh, population. But our definitions of success and our moral compass are a little off, I would argue. And that leads into that. Uh, there's also the historical aspect and the education that Sarah's brought up many times. And when part of movements that I've been a part of uh, to let people know that you're, for example, for daddies and house cleaners, we're part of helping to um, create the Domestic Worker Bill of Rights. And why was it a moral imperative that we have new rights for nannies and house cleaners? And we made very clear, it's because the lack of rights that they have is due to a vestige of slavery. This is what you are continuing by not paying her over time or not having or giving her the same rights that other workers have. So knowing that so much of their exclusivity has nothing to do with how hard people worked, but has everything to do with vestiges of slavery and discriminatory passed down laws um, that the wealth that some communities have managed to concentrate is due to racial covenants it has nothing to do with hard work. It has nothing to do with how hard my, my family members would have worked or hard at least in order to try and get in those neighborhoods. And so sometimes there's a, there's a, there's a real necessity to explain to people uh, this is, you're starting right now in 2021 of how hard you worked in this moment to get into Wellesley. We're starting from 1917 as one of the examples of the case law. That's what we're looking at in terms of <laughs> the zoning law. Um, I also think there's a real misunderstanding of people aren't excited necessarily to move to Wellesley because it's the hot place to be is the way she's describing it. It might be the best air to breathe, quite literally. Uh, it might be where the green space is. It is where, and we will, we could talk about education and segregation, how they're connected, where the schools are that are public and free. Um, you pay for it in other ways, but there's a concentration of resources that are in these areas that people want access to as well. And so it's, it's not just how hip your neighborhood is. It's just, so you also hogged all the, damn, the good stuff that comes with, with, with being uh, rich that, you know, in East Boston where we have higher asthma rates because we have a highway through our neighborhood. Um, 
or through Chinatown, as you know, through zoning, um, Sarah and Harley, who, where they chose to build highways through neighborhoods to allow for suburban workers to come into the city, not have to deal with the city, work and then leave the city as soon as possible. So I think that there's a real misunderstanding of what people are moving to Wellesley or other towns are trying to get access to as well. Wow, thank you. Now I have some more thoughts to share next time we get asked that question at a, at a presentation. Um, Lydia, I've got some questions for you um, following up on sort of the applicability of what you've done in Boston, do you think to other areas or do you have sort of lessons learned from that process that you think would be useful? And I'm thinking based on my case study areas like immediately north of Boston where there's been a lot of building and there are a lot of concerns about gentrification um, and representation in the political process, um, perhaps in like Revere and Chelsea, Everett, um, oh, like things that you would hope that we could learn from Boston for those areas. Yeah, I mean, we, we and I wanna give um, credit to two people first before I continue, um, to kind of, uh, Kwan, who was a Rappaport fellow who helped to write a report and help us to study the affirmatively furthering fair housing history throughout uh, the country. And also um, James Jennings, a professor at Tufts, who helped us to implement a lot of this analysis. And so the analysis we, we started first was um, looking at uh, who we are and being honest about who we are as a neighborhood in East Boston. We are a, a triple decker family home um, our average incomes, what we look like racially. And so when we talk to developers, we ask, when you're building, are you building for, for this population? Look at your average rents. Look how small your units are. You are clearly excluding families and you're clearly building for an income level that is not representative of the diverse population. Be real. And that's the kind of comparison that any neighborhood can do. If you are not building, especially if one dealing with uh, working class neighborhoods, people, uh, BIPOC neighborhoods, when you're dealing with, and they oftentimes want more development, which is not a bad thing, you want new things, but you, I don't want people to be displaced. And so the, the, it's to give the recipe, it's to give the who we are to the neighborhood, to the developer and say, develop for us, develop for us. And, and to say, and the developers will oftentimes saying for those income levels and so on and so forth, we need certain uh, subsidies, we need certain help, and I, I'm not opposed to that. But I think what you will find is people are more inclined to work with and be creative and think of other ways. For example, we just got rid of um, uh, parking minimums in the city of Boston for uh, high, like projects that are 60% affordable or more. That's a creative back and forth to make sure that, okay, you can't afford to build for this income level, but parking is so expensive, that's one less thing you'll have to build. Let's get creative. And I think that that's really the first thing neighborhoods, any neighborhood can do is look at themselves, be honest about who they are, and be honest if you really want the neighborhood to be that diverse. Some, some cities, I'm interested. I'll just say, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but anyway. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, this is directed to, towards you, but in general, all of these, everybody should feel free to chime in. Um, so in Winchester, Mass, uh, an exclusive, like expensive suburb like Wellesley, um, they undertook a 10-year process to upzone the historic walkable downtown that has every amenity in it, including a train station and like a short um, trip to Boston. Um, on the one hand, it was like a lovely planning process and they identified every charming historic uh, building in the downtown and they left the zoning restrictive for the historic buildings and to discourage teardowns. Um, and then for the gas stations and the ugly 1960s buildings, they upzoned. And I appreciated the careful effort and I'm sort of directing this to Sarah because I know that you've been focused on historic preservation also. Um, so, but this process that Winchester undertook took ages. So it was 10 years and in the end it only allowed for about 200 more homes. And that's in the context of a housing crisis and a need for hundreds of thousands of homes in the region. Um, so I was thinking sort of one approach to sort of solve this issue of the housing crisis is the state could go ahead and preempt local processes that are causing a housing shortage and sprawl and some advocates are pushing for that the state could allow for dense building in and near downtowns um, 
of course, this is very controversial. And I guess I was wondering from your work and with Desegregate Connecticut, um, do you support state preemption? And is there like a middle road that preserves some local oversight while actually getting more housing built? Yeah, thanks for the question. And I guess I'll put on my his historical hat again. It's the state that has zoning authority. The state and every state in the country uh, has adopted enabling acts that pass off the zoning authority to local governments. And when they pass it off in these enabling acts, they have for a hundred years already told local governments, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do. This is what your commissions have to look like. This is how you have to conduct public hearings. Here are the kinds of things you can regulate and cannot regulate. So the idea and this, this kind of conversation about um, that state is preempting local laws, it really, um, kind of uh, goes against, I guess, what I would consider the history of zoning and the, the, the zoning authority really resting with the state. Um, so I guess I would say uh, in the Massachusetts example, uh, just last year, Massachusetts passed uh, a, a, an, an amendment to its Zoning Enabling Act that requires towns with MBTA train stations uh, to zone in that area for, up, for 15 units per acre minimum. Now, this is not a heavy lift. This is pretty doable, uh, 15 units per acre, um, but it does set a statewide baseline to guide municipal zoning. And it does give uh, municipalities uh, discretion as to how exactly they will do that. No doubt, because it's a, a very loose standard, we will see litigation about that in Massachusetts as developers sue towns to ensure that they are complying with the 15 unit per acre minimum. Um, but nonetheless, it suggests that even in Massachusetts, and by the way, that passed nearly unanimously on a bipartisan basis, um, it, it shows that in Massachusetts, there is an appetite for uh, having the state set additional guidelines, I like to call them, for local governments to follow. And that's been true for 100 years in zoning. That's what we've been trying to do in Connecticut, too. For when we look at transit-oriented communities this next session, um, we hope that we'll be doing something uh, at matching Massachusetts or even exceeding it with our 60 train stations. Uh, we also, last session, we proposed transit last session that got cut. But last session, we also proposed a walkable communities uh, initiative that would enable a town to zone for as of right two to four family housing around small town um, main streets, uh, as well as large towns too. Um, but, but the as of right part in, in these areas is, is really important. Connecticut does have now a definition for as of right. That means without a public hearing uh, and other onerous requirements, variances, and so on. Um, th that's the kind of thing that the state can do to help ensure that local governments are setting out these clear rules uh, that you mentioned developers want. Okay. Um, so one of the issues as I see it is that the cost of construction right now is like very high um, and that that's one of the reasons why developers um, like cannot build housing, new housing that's affordable um, to lower income and even like middle income people. And so um, the sort of the best we could hope for is requiring like a cross subsidization of units where you have very expensive market rate units and then some units that are below market rate and the rents or the sales prices of those units don't cover the cost of construction. Um, one of the things that I've been hearing, like in Newton, where I come from, a also like expensive suburb of Boston, um, is that people see that apartments, new apartments that are getting built are very expensive, um, crazy expensive. And it's also clear that um, it's not, I guess it's not entirely clear that new buildings coming in are necessarily diversifying the city because they're so expensive. And then you have some affordable units, but perhaps like people who are local and if the local community isn't as diverse as the state or other areas, you're maybe drawing from a pool that's not as diverse. But so the, the new buildings that are multifamily housing aren't necessarily diversifying the communities. And I think that that's sort of something that Harley um, touched on in his comments too. Um, so some people are saying like in Newton that like, why are you calling this effort to upzone like an effort to desegregate and is that disingenuous? We get a lot of like pushback locally about that. Um, and that, so I'm just like, wondering sort of what your responses are to that, um, that issue. Um, if you feel that 
it's still important to have multifamily housing for like a desegregating um, agenda, even where it's like crazy expensive because that's the cost of construction. I think that's a tough question. I mean, so, you know, there's something to be say, said about housing filtering um, that, you know, it's possible that the new units do go to higher income households. I mean, is that ideal? No. Um, but it's also about preserving your existing housing stock and improving that. Um, you know, some, you know, my response to developers, like, you know, building housing is very expensive. Yes, it is. But, um, but some of this is about the profit margin that you'd like to walk away with. And so, I mean, um, I think you should work the work of, uh, I hate to throw more stuff into the chat here, um, but my colleagues, Margie Dewar and Lon Deng have done some great work um, looking at how developers have sold their LIHTC credits um, and how that kind of actually reduces the, the number of units over time um, that once you lose those LIHTC credits so that you can subsidize it through LIHTC credits and then you lose them because the developers sell them after eight, nine years. Um, and so we've seen that even in Detroit where we have, you know, there's plenty of room for housing, but the light tech credits are the only way that we can build them and they get lost. We also had some experiments um, with tiny houses and that those were expensive to build. And you would assume that those would be very easy to build and they weren't. So, you know, I think this is, you know, it's the cost of housing and its regulations, but then it's also um, thinking about what's happening, um, what's actually happening with the profit margins and looking at the performance, you know, really, really delicately. So, so there's that, but about the upzoning, I, I mean, I like the term upzoning, I, I feel like people hear, they hear, I'm gonna lose, I, I think the kind of the dog whistle there is, I'm gonna lose my way of life if you upzone. Um, and, and so I think there's something about maybe a re-education of that word, or maybe even finding new language for talking about what upzoning is. Um, because I, I think that it, it's almost a trigger word for some people that something is going to be lost. Winchester, Medford, it's going to look different if you upzone. Um, versus here is how this is improved. Um, I mean, I, I think if we if we were to call kind of transit oriented, if we were to call a transit oriented design, would people react differently to it? And I think that they might um, to think about, can I get a cup of coffee at the commuter rail station before I, I take off for Boston? I think that sounds different. And so some of this is about strategizing and thinking very carefully about the language and how it actually informs the discussions. I, um, you know, so I, every day, or at least once a week, I'm presented with a new project for my district. So I, I talk with developers all the time. And um, they oftentimes are the greatest back, uh, back patters, if you will, when it comes to the wonderful things that they're doing for the community. I think for some, you know, I, I can't help but roll my eyes the hardest when they're sitting there talking about how they're helping to integrate our neighborhoods with, you know, luxury housing, but they're doing a lot of it. It isn't, right? And I'm not gonna let them, I don't let them uh, pat themselves on the back saying we need to upzone and get more dense because we really need to make sure that we have racial integration. I, I think it's, it's actually, I think it's very offensive. I don't think upzoning, like if you are not intentional about racial integration, you will not have it. And we have that example, it's called the seaport. It is just, just when developers ran, wild and got to build what they wanted to do they built that and it is not a racially integrated it's a brand new neighborhood this was with all the lessons learned all the money all the private investment everything that they built it's not even transit oriented it's going to flood it's in a fishbowl uh, there's not a playground there is not um a little bit of green space was supposed to be there well over an acre is down to a postage stamp of a green space uh, there's uh not a school there's there's they built and they are dense as they wanted to be and that's what you get none of them considered racial justice or integration and 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 i they unless they are required to and that's the other thing too about zoning developers are the most creative minds i've ever met they they figured out how to develop housing that floats on water i had a proposal they can do it you need to set the rules and you need to be intentional in what you demand of them to do and they'll make money. And that's why zoning is the key component. Um, it's been so exclusive for us to turn it on its head and make it inclusive and make it a healing aspect and demand that they have to be part of this in order to build. So no, density doesn't mean integration. It just means more units. Sarah, do you have any more comments on that? And then I'm gonna hand it over to David Lubroff to ask the audience questions. 
No, I, I'm looking forward to the questions. There's only a okay. hundred of them, literally, in the, in the yeah. <laughs> open Great. Q &A. So, David Lubroff is uh, my friend and mentor from the Joint Center. Uh, you can take it away. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, and as Sarah just said, it, it's an extraordinary set of questions. It's been really quite challenging to both listen to the conversation um, and then also read through the questions. I, I've been trying to sort of pull out some common themes from them uh, that um, we might address. And, and I apologize in advance. Uh, we can't get to all of them. We couldn't get to all of them if we spent all afternoon here, but it's just testament to how important this is. I want to start. There are a bunch of questions. Uh, and and um, Har Harley, you, you were answering one of them originally because some people were saying, well, why shouldn't we think about the market solving this by by building more housing? And uh, Councillor Edwards, you, you were touching on this, but um, can zoning reform alone, this, this was officially a, a, an event on zoning, um, address a variety of other issues we care about? Specifically, uh, some folks have worried about affordability and, and a bunch of folks have worried about environment, not worried about, but raised uh, environmental issues. Um, so the, the sort of strategies that all of you have been involved with uh, in trying to reform zoning, um, how can you harness that to address climate change, uh, environmental and social justice, et cetera? Um, Sarah, why don't we start with you and, and then uh, everybody else can sort of weigh in. Sure. Zoning affects everything that's built in our society, uh, certainly in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Of course, Texas, where I'm from, has a lot of unincorporated, unzoned areas, but um, places where people tend to congregate, uh, our decisions are completely and totally bound by zoning. Uh, it, it dictates uh, our economy. It dictates how we relate to each other. It dictates our personal choices, our employment opportunities, our educational opportunities, and so much more. So I do think that zoning is a powerful tool to enable us to improve the way that we live and interact with each other. I don't think that we've gotten it right in the vast majority of cases. We've gotten it wrong, um, and for reasons that uh, the councilwoman uh, mentioned, um, you know, that there, there are situations where people thought, well, maybe this, this is, you know, let, let's set these rules. And then it, it went awry for a reason, for, in a way that couldn't allow Boston to achieve its other goals for, in the seaport, for example, with regard to equity and providing um, infrastructure for young people and so on. Um, so I do think that while zoning reform will never, ever be the only solution, it is the root of the structural uh, racism that's embedded in our, uh, our overall land development laws. So we have to address zoning. We've also got to address affordable housing subsidies and voucher programs um, uh, at schools. I mean, we have 50 million other things to do, but zoning is at the root of it. And that's why understanding what the research says, understanding what we can do with zoning and empowering people to go to their local commissions and their state legislatures to make change at two levels is critically important. Harley or Councillor Edwards uh, um, or Amy, you were my you were my last. You, okay. I, was, I was having you back clean up, but go ahead. Okay, go ahead, Lydia. Um, well, yeah, I know. And, and doing some of our case law research, I mean, there was it's zoning at its fundamental is about the public public welfare. It says that actually in our mission, and it says that in many of the mission statements for zoning and ordinances, it is about the public welfare and safety and health. And so. It, Therefore, I name an aspect of our lives that doesn't include that, um, the air we breathe, the, um, whether, the, whether you have sunlight, whether you have access to, whether you're in a basement, whether you're at the top of the building, uh, how we allow for access to those things. I mean, honestly, it is, it is I can't think of anything more uh, local than how we choose to build. And, and what hands, what we allow for our hands to do. So yeah, I, I, I think uh, we just passed Beardo, which is the Building Emissions Reduction Act in Boston, reduced 7% of buildings, produce 80% of the emissions in the entire city. Just going back to zoning and also regulating how we build to do that in order to impact climate change. That's a perfect example. Amy, did you, uh, or Harley? Yeah, so 
Zoning is a tool for the public to capture value from private development. It's used like that very often um, and for getting affordable housing included in projects for open space present preservation um, for infrastructure upgrades. Um, what I've seen in my surveys of zoning bylaws and ordinances is that um, it's not a transparent system of value capture. Uh, so uh, typically um, projects get um, negotiated project by project. And so you could look at a zoning bylaw and not really know what the priorities are for the municipality. Um, as in a uh, comparison, like a a municipal budget document is a statement of values, where you're spending your money or the things that you care about. Uh, but with the zoning, it'll say you need a special permit for this project or you need to go to city council to get this project approved. But it doesn't really often spell out exactly what you would need to do in order to get it. And that's where the negotiations begin. And so every project comes in um, with a lot of risk because it's like, I'm not sure what's going to convince them. Some sort of back room negotiations, who knows how the, you know, how the sausage gets made, how you get to approval. Um, and that there's a lot more that cities and towns could do in writing their zoning to make really clear what their priorities are and cities and towns it's a lot of work on them for their city councilors um, to ask constituents how do you prioritize different things that we could be asking for from development I think that's great what Lydia was talking about saying this is who we are as a community and they're doing that work up front um, to make it very explicit in the um, zoning, you can even list, like if you care about, you know, your bike lanes and that's the kind of infrastructure you want, that could be one of the things that sort of makes the project more favorable is that there's like bike infrastructure um, or is it affordable units or, you know, open space or whatever the list of things are, sort of what things you could get more density for offering um, if there are trades, make that explicit in, in your zoning and do that work up front. So it's less more predict the the uh, getting projects approved should be more predictable. So I, I think there was those were all brilliant comments, and I agree with all of it. Um, I would just add, it, it's important to bring zoning out of the shadows. It's this thing that almost no one ever thinks about and doesn't know about. And so I think Amy started us off talking about disparities in education and access. Um, and I think that that's important. That's an important to to note that. People who are educated about what planning is and how it governs their property and how they live um, are able to swing the process and what it does in their favor. And so I think that there's something to be said for um, thinking about public participation and the way that it actually intersects with how zoning happens, um, how rezoning can happen, um, so that it doesn't become a crude instrument that actually can be used to exclude. When it's in the shadows, that's what zoning can do. There's a, a couple of questions that. Um pick up on, on a, a kind of an interesting conundrum that, that I have to confess I hadn't completely thought about. And, and, and Harley, some of it goes back to some of the points I think you were making about the, the racial home ownership gap, which is just, you know, a stunning thing, which is for the most part, um, all the multifamily housing, particularly large multifamily housing being built in the United States is now rental. Um, we've been documenting at the Joint Center that that you know, less than 5%, I think, is, 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 is condos. Um, so on the one hand, we like, it, at least in, in certain areas, dense development. On the other hand, we're trying to encourage, you know, we think that home ownership under certain circumstances is a great wealth building strategy, but are, are, it, it, it seems like we're sort of forcing people to either live in dense areas and urban areas or go out to less dense areas with with all of those trade-offs is there is that a real conundrum and is is there any way to think about how we might get at that um to to, to both build the housing we need make it affordable but also off you know still offering folks the uh, the opportunity to get at the wealth building that, that the home ownership has provided I, I mean, I'll, that we'd like you to turn lead into gold. Sure. I mean, and I'll, I'll, I'll just say this. I mean, I'll, I, there's a, it, the, we know from our uh, experience here in Detroit, it's the missing middle um, that we do have housing, but we don't have anything towards kind of working, you know, kind of working class um, families and poor families. 
Um, and so even with that new housing, and we don't, and certainly in places like Detroit, we don't have nearly as much of it as we need. Um, we don't have that missing middle. Um, and even the housing filtering is not possible. The second thing I would just say is a little bit more personal. You know, my parents bought the house that I grew up in off River Street for $25,000 the year I was born. You know, the entire trajectory of my life um, the entire trajectory was based on some of the resources that were available in Boston and the wealth that they were able to derive from when they sold the house when we moved out of Boston. Um, nothing else would have been possible if not for what they sold. Um, and so I'm very clear about what it means. I mean, there's nothing wrong with renting. I mean, I think there's great utility in that and have the flexibility to move, change careers, move to other regions, great utility in that. Um, and there's great risk in home ownership at the same time. Um, if you are able to access home ownership, there are great benefits. Um, and I, I think we don't want to walk um, BIPOC communities out from those opportunities as we think about rezoning. I think um, some, of, some we have some examples in Boston, like uh, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative and other land trusts, for example, that for the, the land is then communally owned for those who don't know, and then the buildings are built and you can own the building, you can own the home, and then they often cap what you can sell it for, allowing for maybe a 5% return in order to allow for the next working class, the next working family to come in and also be able to purchase. And so there's been some wonder, there's been some question about whether uh, if, if the wealth building is one of the goals, if that cap could be slightly raised uh, in exchange for them staying much longer or, or are not leaving or being able to transition to um, back to the nonprofit or to the, to the land trust that can eat Eat, or excuse me, can absorb the increased price and then take the loss on when they sell it to somebody else. So there's there's looking at the models we already have. I, I have been a big proponent of the um, alternative economy uh, and I, I'm, 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 I'm a cooperator, if you will, and I've been doing uh, working in housing co-ops and looking at ways in which uh, people can build wealth and collective ownership. Uh, it is not as much, but there's there's people forget the amount of wealth you have just by uh, the wealth and mental, emotional, and um, financial stability in knowing that you have housing. Because people don't understand that when you are trying to struggle to pay rent, that the, the, the official tax that you pay out of pocket, 70% sometimes of your income out of pocket, which is what, but the, what that means in terms of work hours, what that means in terms of commuter hours, what that means in terms of mental and emotional, there's a lot of payments that come with just the lack of housing stability. So uh, that you don't have sometimes if you have sustainable rents. So I, I, I'm the first homeowner in my family. I've been a renter most of my life. My mother rented uh, all of her life until very recently. Um, and we, I can, I can assure you, again, I, I feel the huge difference uh, just by being able to know what's stable. Uh, and so, so let's not forget about that wealth as well. Mental health, emotional health, how many people work two or three jobs to pay rent as well? Amy or, or Sarah, do you wanna weigh yeah. in on, on this point or? In the affluent suburbs that I've looked at, there's a real lack of rental housing. So I would, and I think a bias against rental housing and I see it in hearing comments where people say they would really prefer to have condos come in than rental units. Um, so I, I would encourage cities and towns to allow fully like rental and, and not, try and push people to like um, just permit or allow um, ownership units. And I don't think it's even legal for them to favor ownership over, over rental. Um, I'm not like sure of the details, um, but I would say that there is an opportunity to be allowing two family houses, three family houses, four families um, that are often, once they're built, sold as condos and that those create opportunities for people who um, may not be in the market for the single family or, um, and that diversifying the housing stock is just all sorts of benefits for creating choice for people and opportunities and, um, and filtering too. So there are like seniors in single family houses who might want to move to a poor family um, where the condo association handles the um, upkeep of the yard. <laughs> and, um, and then another family moves into the single family. Creates flexibility. Um, there are a whole bunch of questions, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try a little tight white rope act here, see if I can merge them into one, which are really about the sort of the politics. Um, Sarah, some 
specifically directed at the, the efforts in Connecticut. Um, I, I, one that sort of sums it up for me was, you know, how can historic preservation neighborhood conservation support equitable zoning? Often these two camps are at odds and could they be brought together or how are they brought together to advocate for more housing? And, and, I, and I wanna put the, the twist in that that because there were a couple of really interesting questions uh, about parking and anybody who's ever, count, Councilor Edwards, I'm sure you, you more than once have, have heard you know, that the, the, the piece of resistance is, is parking. And so a couple of people picked up on um, the fact that, that uh, about reduced parking requirements that, that Sarah, you were talking about. Um, so how, do, how can you, what's the political strategy that has allowed the sort of people's love of, of existing communities to, to combine with the desire for equitable uh, development and zoning? Uh, what, what was the secret sauce in Connecticut and, what's, and elsewhere? Yeah, so I love talking about parking. Um, I think it is the single most important thing that zoning jurisdictions across this, the country can do um, is eliminate minimum parking requirements. Um, in, uh, and I had posted earlier in the chat a link to our parking page so you can find more, more information there. But the bottom line is, you know, it, people have the impulse that, well, I need, I need my car, I need a space to put my car. Um, so when you're talking about um, zoning reforms, you have to kind of explain to them, well, part of the reason you need your car is because we've embedded cars into our zoning codes and into many other types of law. Greg Schill, a professor at Iowa, I'll put something in the chat, uh, wrote a paper called How Law Subsidizes Driving. Um, but parking requirements have, and somebody asked what they were, they, they basically when you, it says in the zoning code, if you build a unit of housing, you have to build two parking spaces or three parking spaces with it. And we found in Connecticut, and I dropped a link to a, a deep dive uh, on the data where you have a, a big section on parking. We found in Connecticut that some zoning codes, when they would allow housing, uh, especially in wealthy towns, uh, they would require three units of parking for one studio apartment. So what person living in a studio apartment typically will have three cars that they need to house, not that many, um, but the parking requirements were used as a tool to reduce the amount of apartments that were actually in the neighborhood. You know, historically we did not, if you look at a historic main street, there's a ton around the Boston area, uh, those did not develop with parking. You don't have a curb cut uh, and the reason uh, in every lot. And the reason that people love those areas is because they can walk down the street without kind of being accosted by cars with every single lot. So historically, we didn't used to build that way and we really shouldn't anymore. And that's why we had so many people kind of come around to the idea that, well, we have to do these minimum parking mandates. Hartford, when I was chair of the Zoning Commission, completely eliminated them completely citywide and the city is still doing its thing. And we've seen a lot of development without uh, parking or with much, much less parking um, than they would have developed otherwise. So I say that the parking front, you people's initial reaction, just like with a lot of zoning changes is, we've got to keep this, we've got to keep it. But then when you sort of say, well, this is, you know, the, there's so 30% of Americans or whatever the figure is, don't even drive because they're kids, they're elderly, they're disabled, they, they can't, they don't want to drive um, and they can't afford driving. Um, so there's a huge chunk of the population that's shut out when we design our cities for cars. And that's what minimum parking requirements and zoning codes require us to do. Anyone have anything they want to add to, to that? Um, there've been a bunch of questions about, um, specifically about gentrification and, and, and you know, the extent to which zoning can be a, a, a tool um, to address either real gentrification or concerns about gentrification. Um, and, and to me, in my mind, they're also related to questions about, um, how do, how do you think about policies, the differences in the kinds of policies that are needed in, in urban settings and in suburban settings uh, and, and in rural settings? And, and even I would divide uh, and, uh, the urban settings of, of places like Boston, you know, which are growing where house prices are appreciating quite rapidly uh, versus, you know, older urban places that, that really haven't uh, seen some of those significant changes, some of the municipalities uh, um, in, in Michigan and, and in Ohio, um, and, and even, you know, some of the older industrial cities in Connecticut that, 
um, still seem to be uh, suffering a lot. So, so how do you specifically think about gentrification, but, but particularly if you're working at the state level, how do you think about the, the package of, of what's needed um, suburban, urban, fast growing uh, versus slow growing markets? Harley, you want to? You want to? Yeah, you know, no, I was, I was, I was just trying to put my thoughts together. So, I, I, you know, in, in a couple of places, I've seen, um, you know, I, I said earlier that I was nervous about upzoning, but I, I'm, I'm also nervous about downzoning. And so, when I, where I've seen um, municipalities um, attempt to convert, um, kind of create restrictions, um, and convert um, um, two and three um, unit houses into single family, back into single family into their historic, their original um, form, um, there's something going on there. Um, and so College Park, Georgia is a great example where they outlawed um, kind of they, they, they eliminated all of their duplexes and forced them to go back to single family and you saw the prices increase dramatically. Um, and the racial demographics of the city changed accordingly in, in subsequent kind of several um, kind of cycles of the American Community Survey. So I think there's something to be said for paying attention to, you know, the ways in which this can be a double edged sword. I and mean, we can talk about upzoning, doing one thing to increase, you know, kind of access to housing, but downzoning can do the opposite. Um, and that, you know, there's particular rationales and, and intents um, behind the downzoning efforts. Councillor Edwards, any thoughts on this? You're muted. All right, well, um, sorry, I, I, I was honestly a little confused by the question. <laughs> I, <if laughs> my, my, my bad, I, I, think, um, I think particularly it'd be interesting to get your perspective on how, can you use zoning as a tool, um, particularly in a district like yours that, that's changing so rapidly um, to mitigate the pace of gentrification or to oh. stop gentrification? Sure, well, um, I don't know if you'll ever be able to stop it. I think um, that the, the very form of, the word mitigation means to compensate for injury, right? It's to, it's to acknowledge that. And what we've done is we created a neighborhood housing trust. Uh, and it has millions of dollars in it. And we extracted that from the developer who's building uh, Suffolk Downs. But we decided it wasn't enough for him to just, or them to plop down one amount of money one time. So I wrote a trust and we passed the trust of the city council and East Boston now has a neighborhood housing trust that's uh, held by the development department of the city of Boston. And my job as a city councilor, uh, to be very frank, is to shake down every developer that I can and make them contribute to that trust and to make sure it is robust with as much money as possible. Because while they love to give money to our little league teams or to beautify the median roads and to do everything that has nothing to do with keeping uh, any of our residents in their homes, I would prefer they just give the money. And I wrote the trust in a way that uh, it, it prioritizes people who have expertise in homelessness in immigration in environmental justice, and as opposed to the typical trustees that are put on that are well-connected folks who know uh, politicians, I, and so I made sure that the, the trustee positions were de designed to be uh, people who want to house people. And finally, you have to live in East Boston to be a trustee. So we are finishing our final list of trustees to come on and they have one job and that's to give out money to help with rental assistance and home ownership in East Boston. And my, my job is to shake down that money to make sure that that trust is full. Uh, the other thing we did uh, is uh, to make sure that um, the trust, uh, he, he, the developer also had to pay a recent amount of money uh, that we're distributing in thousand dollar increments. Uh, we've distributed up to, we're about to send out, we sent $200,000 out. We're gonna do another $400,000. Now, this is an interesting question because you're assuming a neighborhood has development. It's almost interesting. You have to have a certain amount of wanting to invest in and money coming to you in order to leverage, in order to turn it on its head. Not every neighborhood has that, and but are still facing displacement and over um, and gentrification. So this this model may not work, say in Springfield or in other places that don't have the massive amount of uh, money being infused into their cities, but are still finding housing to be uh, inequitable. Sarah, Amy, Amy, why don't you start and then Sarah and then 
uh, number I just wrap up. Think the best thing that we could do for housing affordability overall is to build more housing. Um, and that overall housing itself is not what's causing gentrification and displacement. These are like broad and powerful like, economic forces um, that are really multi-dimensional and that we need to not just look to like zoning policy to make sure that um, everybody has enough income to pay for their basic needs like food and shelter. Um, and that for some people, it's an income challenge um, that they can't afford housing and they're getting displaced. And that we could um, have sort of greater housing stability if we didn't have as much poverty. Um, and that there are other levers of social policy to be addressing issues of poverty um, than, than just sort of like your house building policy or zoning. Um, so yeah, that's that's my take on it. Okay, Sarah. Yeah, I disagree with Amy. More housing will reduce gentrification. Study after study has shown that. We've seen people, you know, in, in our Connecticut political advocacy say, "Well, I, we can't permit this housing because it's market rate housing, um, and that will lead to gentrification." And in most cases um, where it's been studied, if you're building new housing, it actually lowers rents for everyone because it loosens up this constrained housing supply. Well, we've tried to predict um, uh, you know, every little uh, decision that's made at the local level, we've tried to micromanage it and what that's, a, that's resulted in. And that's why this paper I put in the chat is called Zoning by a Thousand Cuts. We just like, reduce and reduce and reduce the ability of, of anyone to build housing. And that's where, um, I'm not saying we need no zoning. We do need to have, you know, when we do the transit oriented development bill, we're gonna push for, we're gonna, we don't want it if it's not at least 10% mandatory deed restricted affordable on those projects. So we agree that, you know, something needs to be done to ensure that there's equitable development. But uh, at the same time, we all have to accept this just basic sentence, more housing is better for everyone, everybody. If I, if I may just, I'm sorry, I know it's 129. I can say this in Boston, we have had more housing than we've ever had before. Our rents did not go down. So, so I was, was gonna say, they, they might not have gone rent. down, but they might not have gone up as much as they, as they might have. <laughs> uh, um, I don't know if I agree but, with that either, but. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but that, that um, I, I want to. Uh, I, I apologize to just the many people who asked just unbelievably terrific questions um, that we only just nibbled at. Um, I appreciate my colleagues here, um, both answering questions, thinking about them, and simultaneously writing. I can't do that. Um, I want to thank the, the folks at, at, at uh, the Rappaport Center and Boston um, College Law School uh, for doing the heavy lifting of, of, of putting this all together. Um, this is really important work and um, the the future of it will probably go long past some of our careers and and so it's quite appropriate that the last word will go to the next generation of leaders on this uh praise tolman it's all yours good afternoon everyone on behalf of the boston college black law students association the rapaport center for law and public policy and the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies, we express our gratitude and thanks to our incredible panelists for being productive contributors to such an important conversation. We would also like to thank all of you for sharing your time with us. I am honored to have been present today and I'm hopeful that events like this spark good trouble and continued conversation. Thank you all again for attending. We have an event on Friday, November 5th, legal issues inside the Biden presidential campaign with the former senior counsel and deputy general counsel of the Biden for President campaign. To attend virtually and to get updates on upcoming programs, please see the chat box for a link to sign up for the center's newsletter or go to bc.edu slash Rappaport. I hope y'all have a great evening or afternoon. <laughs>